as every one of their parents picked them up. I celebrated in my heart and a little on the outside. Anyways, uh, we're, we're, it is good to be here this morning. I, I feel like um, I feel like at times we, as the church, um, we we come and we we get in a routine. Um, you get in a routine. You come to church. You you come. You you wait. You set your alarm on Sundays. You come and you fill a pew and you sit in a seat. Some people serve and you serve in the in the in the parking lot. Or you serve and, you, and we have a routine and on Sunday mornings and we do it every Sunday. And there's nothing wrong with the routine. The problem is I feel like if we're not careful. That routine can soon go rut. And, that, and I believe that the Holy Spirit um, has not called us to live in a rut. I believe with all of my heart that the, that the message that the Holy Spirit has for us is not called us to live a life that's comfortable and, with, and, and without... Um, ...effort of that, I believe that God is, that's my call. That my call is not always to, to give a pat on the back and say, hey, man, you're doing a great job. Yay. And the reason I have a hard time with that is not because I have a hard time seeing God at work in your life. It's not, it's not it. I see God at work. I hear stories all the time, testimonies of what God is doing, and I celebrate what God's doing. But I can't celebrate and sit there too long. Because if I celebrate and I sit, then, I, then the best days are behind me, not in front of me. And I believe that in our celebration of what God is doing in our life, sometimes we, we camp out there too long and we forget that that's not where we're supposed to stay, that God has more for us. And so this morning, I just, I, I pray that the word of God today challenges you like it challenges me. Uh, because there's times in my life where I preach messages and it just, and it just, it's not necessarily for me, but I feel like it's just, I could tell God put it on my heart for, for some, but that, I, that I've gotten comfortable in my life and I, I don't want to ever live with that set of, of being comfortable. Um, and I, I want to press in. I want to become who God's called me to be. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about reading between the lines. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter 28. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible that's in the pew in front of you, if, or chair in front of you because we have no pews. If you look for the pew in front of you, you're going to be looking for a long time. It's a chair. It's right underneath it. Anyways, there's a Bible right there. You can have that's that's actually a gift to us from from us to you. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we, we we encourage you to take that Bible with you. Put your name in it. It's from us to you. We want to make sure you have a written copy of God's Word, or you can follow us on. You can do it on your phone, um, or you can follow behind us on the screen. All those ways, the Scripture will appear, not magically, but on purpose. And so. Um, that's, that's where it's going to be. Let's, let's bow our head, close our eyes, let's open the word of prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, God, that it's timeless that, and that it's true and that it's true to us. Father God, that you spoke a word thousands of years ago and today we can apply it to our lives. And so God, today, I pray that we can apply what you're, you're saying to us, to our lives today, right now. God, help us understand your word. Help us to apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been married for 23 years. This August the 5th will be 23 years. That's a reason to clap. You can clap. It's my mom that's clapping, but because she, she's like, I can't believe someone's, she's, he's found someone to live with him for 23. What a miracle. Thank you, Jesus. And it, it is a miracle. I've been married for 23 years, and I'll, I'll, I will tell you something that I've learned as a husband, and I think that if we, if we ask all the wives to leave this morning, that all the husbands can be here, we can all tell the truth. I mean, we can all be really honest with each other. But there's things that, that we do in, my, in our marriage and in our lives that, that I have to read between the lines. There's things that my wife says. After 23 years, there's sometimes that she says things, and it's not what she says, it's what she means. For instance, there's times she says, hey, when you get a moment, that's not really what she means. She doesn't really mean when I get a moment, she'd like me to do something. What she really means is when you get a moment, that means on your marks, get set, put your shoes on. Why are you still listening to me? You should be moving. It's like the Steve Frick, move now. I realized that. It took me a long time. Like, I'm like, I'm listening. Because in my mind, I'm listening. I'm hearing her say, hey, when you get them over, that means at some point today in your schedule, when you remember, if you'll take care of this, what she really means is do it right this minute. Don't wait another second. Like, don't let grass grow under your feet. 
There's this communication. It's not what she said. It's like I got to read between the lines. My Holy Spirit. <laughs> she also gives, there's, there's so many different, different examples. I'm only going to use a couple. When she says, I'm hot or I'm cold, that's not really because she wants me to understand where her external temperature is. It's because she wants me to make an adjustment. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm hot means turn the air on, roll the window down, turn the fan on. Like, there's, uh, there's you know what I'm saying? And it's, it could be any of those things. It could be all of those things. You understand what I'm saying? I'm cold, but me, I need another blanket. Turn the heat on, turn the air conditioner off. Like, there's all these things. And none of them are said directly. None of them are said directly. I, give my, I joke all the time. I'm like, you've learned a, a form of communication that is so efficient. It's like short text. It's like, she says three words and I, I again for whole sentences. I'm thirsty means you need to get me some water. It's not what's being said. It's what, what she means. And, and after 23 years of marriage, I get it. I'm like more and more every day. Now there are days I miss it like completely. I miss it completely. There are days I pick up on it quickly. I find myself jumping out of bed, turning the, the fan off before I even realize what I'm doing. Reading between the lines. And I feel, feel like when we read the New Testament and Jesus is communicating with, the, with his disciples, there are times when he he's gives these parables and these analogies. And I think when you, when you read the response, you know that the look on their face is like bewilderment. They're like, what? And he's like, okay, let me say it again. So he finds another analogy, another parable, and he says it another way. And they're still like, mm -mm, I don't, I'm not getting it. There's times when he's expecting the, 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 the audience, the, the, his disciples to kind of read between the lines and understand what he's saying. And then there are times when Jesus is so direct that there is no misinterpretation of it. That it's clear, that it's crystal. That we don't have to wonder, we don't have to guess. It's so crystal clear. Not that the other times Jesus communicates is not crystal clear. You just have to understand context and what he's saying. But there's sometimes Jesus is so direct because he don't want anyone to miss it. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus has died on the cross. He's resurrected from the grave. He's appeared to the disciples and he's about to, end, he's about to go to heaven for the last time. And he appears to them in Matthew. And this is where we're at. Matthew chapter number 28, starting in verse 18, it says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has all authority. Nobody else. Jesus has all authority. That means that all, that means that any authority that you give the enemy of your soul, it's not because Jesus gave it to him, it's because you gave it to him. Jesus has all authority because he alone paid the price for our sins. He alone won the, won the keys to death, hell, and the grave. So it's Jesus alone who has all authority. There is no secondary. It's not most of it. It's not 99.9%. .9%. It's not a, it's all. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to Jesus. And Jesus is in return telling his disciples, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And here I'm giving you a directive. I'm giving you a command. I'm telling you with all the authority in heaven and on earth that you have. At times, the enemy of our soul is referred to as the ruler of this world. The difference is he's the ruler of this world, but he's not the authority in this world. And Jesus says, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And I'm telling you, I'm sending you. You know what that does? That gives you the authority of Jesus. Does it make you Jesus? Don't, don't anyone get a God complex? but it gives you the authority of Jesus because he's giving you the command. When I tell my kids stuff, I'd say, hey, go, you know, when I, or I'm sorry, not when I tell them, but when I send my, I send the little ones to go tell the bigger ones. They love that. They, they love that. It's like music to Kirsten's ears that she gets to go tell her brothers what to do. But it's not different from her. I mean, the, Luke was the same way when I would tell her to go tell Caleb something. I would tell, I'd say, Caleb, Luke, go tell your, go tell your brother to clean his room. And he would, Luke would, I could hear Luke walk in. And he'd go, Caleb, clean your room. 
And kid like, Luke, get out. <laughs> you know why? Because Caleb's not doing what Luke tells him to do. And the boys don't listen when, <laughs> when she goes in there and bosses both of them. Neither one of them listen, but she bosses them. It's not until she says, I've been given authority because <laughs> dad said so. Dad said, clean your room. At that point, it better be different. I better hear you. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting on it right now. Because I, I have the, all authority in our home. I mean, I, did I share with Tatum? <laughs> all authority. You know how I know I have real authority? is because you, if you're a parent, you know this is how you know you have real authority. When you really know you're, you're important. When you can say to do something and you know why you're raised, you're, you're, what your reason is? Because I said so. That's how you know all authority reigns in your life. <laughs> you want to know because I said so. I don't have to explain it. I don't have to give a good reason. I waited my whole, I had children just so I could say to someone else one day, God bless it. I don't have to tell you why. Because I said so. Because I have all authority in my home. I have the authority. And if they don't do what I say, there are going to be consequences and repercussions. And those consequences and repercussions are going to be felt because I have authority. And when I send one of them to tell the other one, hey, dad said, I ca he carries the weight of my words. You carry the weight of your father's words because he said, go. He said, go. Not because you have authority because you don't. You know, there's nothing that you've done. That's the good news. It's the good news. There's nothing I've done to earn it. I get it because, because my father gave it to me. Because he told me to go. And he's saying this morning, go and make disciples. That word there in, first, in, verse, in verse 19 says, therefore go. Therefore, because, and what that means is because of God's authority, because of the authority that, God, that Jesus has, Go and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't say go to church. It says go make disciples. The problem that we have as a church is that we get real good at coming here and filling a building and filling a seat. That's not the directive God gave us. As much as I want you to come here, beloved, I want you to come every Sunday. But you know why? Because I want you to hear the word that God has for you. And so when you come and you hear God's directive and you do what God says and you plant his word in your heart, you can fully become the man or woman of God that you're supposed to become. But there's more than just coming to church. It has to be more than coming than a, than a facility then when we fill a chair in a building, that doesn't make us the church. That doesn't fulfill the commission of go and make. In fact, part of the problem is that we've relied too heavily on paid staff. And we say, well, that, pastor, that's, that's kind of why we pay you, isn't it? In fact, it's not why you pay me. My job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Your job is the same as my job. It's to go. It's to go and make disciples. It's to go. It's not to evangelize. Evangelizing is going to make sure the good news of Jesus Christ is spread, that we tell people about the freedom that's in Christ, that we tell people about the, who they can become, that they're a new creation, that their old is, is gone, that they're, they're a new creation in Christ. We get to tell, that's the, that's the gospel. Evangelizing is making sure people know it. Discipling is when we live life together. It's more than just showing up on a Sunday, showing up at a small group and having tacos on Tuesday because, I mean, that's not a bad thing. Um, Taco Tuesday is not a bad thing. Celebrate it, beloved. Celebrate Taco Tuesday. But I'm saying that's not discipleship. Jesus gives us the example of discipleship when he, when he takes the, these, these 12 men and these women and he, and he goes through life with them every single day. And they, every single day he is helping them to understand who they're supposed to become. It's a process. And it takes a lifetime. But only disciples can make disciples. O only someone who's willing to live life together and willing to get their hands dirty in the ups and downs, the ins and outs. They're the people who are, made, who are, who are making disciples. 
When I think about, when I think about Pastor Trent and I think about what he, he does with small groups, most of the conversations that we have are about the people that he is involved in their lives. And he's telling me about their problems and their victories. And he's, I can tell him like, that's what it looks like. He's celebrating their victories. He's mourning their losses. He's living life, helping us, helping them to understand who they are in Christ. And I'm like, that's a, that's a disciple making disciples. And that's what God has called every person in here to do, to go and make disciples, not to come to church. We should, I mean, you should come to church. That's part of it, but that's not it. That's not it. That we're called to make disciples, to make sure the people are around us. That's why I love our staff pastors. I don't love Pastor Lauren and Pastor Ethan and what they're doing for when, in kids' church and youth. I don't love them because I feel like they got the best programs. I love them because I know they're making disciples. I'm watching them make disciples of my own kids. It's not because my own kids don't have a father to, to help them and to, to walk through, but they do. But they have someone else who's making sure that the discipleship process, that there's, they're walking through it. And I know that I can tell my son and my sons and my daughter, hey, watch the way Pastor Ethan, watch the way Pastor Lauren lives. You can live and be like them because they are a follower of Christ. They are busy about going and making disciples. But they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones. The problem is the church, we've gotten so comfortable. We come in, we got in our routine, and we forgot. There's more to it. There's more to it. I don't ever want to get to a place where I'm so comfortable that I'm not spiritually growing. And I don't measure myself against someone else. That, I mean, I don't, when I go play golf, I don't measure myself against Pastor Ethan because he's a better golfer. He's not a better golfer. He's, he's, he's definitely not. <laughs> definitely, definitely not a better golfer than I am. But I don't measure my growth as a golfer against him. I measure it against myself. What was my score last time I went out? How well am I, right? It's the same thing. I don't, I don't measure myself against other pastors. You know why people do that? The, the enemy does that. The enemy does that to everybody. He does it to pastors too. They begin to com, you know, compare themselves to somebody else. Well, this pastor's doing that and that pastor's doing this. I don't look at other guys because I don't care what they're doing. That's not what God's called me to do. He's called me to do this. I'm gonna stay in my lane. That's all I have the intelligence to do. I don't have the time or the ability to compare myself to somebody else. So what I need to know is how, how, what does my life look like today and what will it look like next year? Here's what I'm afraid of. You ready? I'm afraid that next year that I'm gonna be in the same place that I am this year right now. And that to me tells me I'm not growing spiritually. There are things that I shouldn't be, that I shouldn't be comfortable with now that I was comfortable with last year, that I'm moving around in my life and I'm changing, I'm becoming more and more like Christ. That's what discipleship looks like that I'm developing, I'm growing closer, that my relationship with the Holy Spirit is different today than it was last year. It's different last year than it was the year before that, that I'm constantly growing, that there's never a place where I sit down and go, ah, I made it, I'm here, I'm on top of the mountain, baby, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not it. That's not it in the kingdom. Like it's a constant growth. And that growth demands that I'm, I'm aware that I'm going and I'm making disciples. This is, not a, this, is not a, a, this is not something that Jesus says, hey, listen, if you have nothing going on on Friday, here's what I'd love you to do. Go grab a Starbucks, pay too much for a bad cup of coffee, and then, you know, go. And if you have time, and I'm not saying I don't impress you, but if you have time, if you go make disciples, that'd be awesome. He's about to ascend to the Father for the very last time. He's, he's going out the door. I always say he's, going, he's, he's headed out the door and he turns back and tells his kids, don't leave the stove on. <laughs> you know, that's what I tell my kids when I leave the house. Well, don't turn the stove on, right? Because I want them to make sure they remember. And he's like, the last thing I want to make sure you remember is go and make disciples. That you're not done here. That I've entered, I'm, I'm headed to heaven you're not done. Go and make disciples. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus as he doesn't just call, call us to, to follow him. He doesn't just call us to go and make disciples. But here's at the very last moment, he says, I've given all authority into heaven and earth. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the last part of that, 
and, and, but here's good, the good news. Don't worry, I'm with you. Always. I'll be with you always. Teach them these things. That I, teach them the commandments that I've taught you. Really simple. Jesus, was, he, he realized his disciples were kind of simple. Thank you, because I'm, I'm simple myself. He says, love Jesus, love the Lord God with all your heart and love people like that. Love people just like you love, I mean, love them like, right? Love people like yourself. It's two things. We can remember that. Two? Everybody good with two? Okay. Not all of you are good right now. Everybody. Everybody awake? Okay. Go to Two, two, two commandments, but he says here, he, the, the best part is he waits till the end. He says, but here, I, and I'm going with you. I'm not sending you by yourself. I'm going with you, and I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. Jesus didn't call, just give us all authority. He didn't just call us to go, but he goes with you. That he's not just sending you out, hoping, do the good luck. <laughs> good luck. When I was a kid, one of the things that we did was we, we pressure washed driveways while my dad pressure washed houses on Saturdays and we got paid. Not good. In fact, I don't know if there were child labor laws intact back then, but they would have come from my father if they had been. But I remember he didn't just drop us off at a house and say, hey, you know, good luck. He was there, and so I knew if there was a problem that I didn't have to worry, I wasn't afraid that I could go because he was right there with me. Your heavenly father's not asking you to go and do something, hoping that you won't mess it up. Don't screw up. <laughs> He's going with you. That means while you're there and while you're going through the process and you're trying to make disciples and, the, and life gets messy, that he didn't just leave you on your own, but that he's there with you and he's, every, he's with you every step of the way. And when you come to a problem, you don't have to just figure it out. Jesus is with you. He's with you. He's given you a task. He's given you all authority. He's given you a command to go and make and he's not just asking you to go by yourself. He's willing to go with you. And church, that's, that's where he leaves. He gave the disciples that, that command thousands of years ago. And you know what the, the, the problem is, is, is? Is we're not doing a great job of it. We feel like, man, that's a great thing for the disciples. But what about for the church today? It's the same command to you and I. And I'm telling you this morning because I think about the, 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 pro, the reason Jesus tells us to go, the reason he goes with us. You know why? It's because Jesus loves the lost. Jesus loves those who are far from God, who don't know who he is. And he's not okay with them dying and going to an eternal hell without him. That he wants them to know who he is. That means I can't be okay with it. That means that I can't be okay with having people in my life that don't know Jesus, that will die and spend eternity in hell unless I'm willing to do what God's called me to do. Can I save anybody? Absolutely not. I was talking to a young girl in the first service, and I was like, that's the beautiful thing about, about winning the loss, about, about witnessing, about going... You can't win the loss. You can't do it by yourself. The Bible says that no man comes to the, to the Father that the Holy Spirit draws him. So the Holy Spirit is constantly drawing. But you know who God uses? He uses you. He uses people that are flawed, that are messed up, that are, that are aggravating. Oh, he uses aggravating people. You know why I know that? Because he uses me. I aggravate my kids, my wife. He uses aggravating people. He uses hot-headed people sometimes. He uses imperfect people. I don't have to point to his disciples. I just point at myself. He uses me. That means he can use you. He wants to use you because Jesus cares about the lost. As we're following through this idea of from, the, from, the, from the cross and the resurrection of Christ, and today we look at why, why is all of it happen? Why did all of it happen? And for one reason, because Jesus loves the lost. Peter says he, it's, he, he wants no one to perish. He wants none to perish without knowing who he is. That means as, 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 as followers of Christ, you and I, the band's gonna come. That you and I as followers of Christ, we can't be, we can't be okay with it. 
I can't be okay. I can't live my life and accept that people are dying and going to hell. And I'm not, I'm not just a little bit, not a lot of bit bothered by it. That doesn't change the way that I live. That someone was bothered enough by, by my running from God. They, they know I needed Jesus. And they stayed up praying for me, believing for me, witnessing to me, sharing the love of Jesus with me. As in turn, it's my job to do the same thing. But it doesn't end when they, when they come to Christ. That I have to be involved in their lives. God, Jesus is calling us to go and make disciples. The discipleship process is messy. Read the New Testament and Jesus' life with the disciples. Just go through and read it. It's messy. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. The disciples are always arguing about something. Who's going to be the biggest and the best? Who's, got the, who's the greatest? Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, who's going to rule by your right-hand side? Read the New Testament. Discipleship making is, disciple make is, is, is man, it's messy. That's because life is messy. God's calling us to go because he cares about the lost. Because it's not okay for us to come to church on a Sunday morning and just sit here and go, man, I enjoyed the message. I feel better about myself as a, as a person. I'm doing such a great job. What great music we had and then leave unchanged. This morning, I, I pray that you leave and that God, God quickens your heart to remember the people that are around you that are far from him. And then it's not somebody else's job to make a disciple of them, it's yours. It's your job to do life with people and help them to become who God's called them to be if you're a follower of Christ. Let's all stand in this place. The lost matter to Jesus and the lost have to matter to us because we're his followers. All authority is given to you to do what God's called you. He's not just calling you, he's given you the authority.